It's easy to look at a modern map and forget just how different the Americas looked 15,000 years ago. But at the height of the last ice age, the Gulf of Mexico, or Gulf of America, or El Golfo de Mexico, whatever you like to call it, wasn't the expansive warm sea we know today. It was narrower, shallower, and surrounded by vast coastal plains that are now buried beneath over a hundred feet of ocean water. Global sea levels were over 300 feet lower than they are today. Between 15,000 and 10,000 years ago, enormous ice sheets blanketed much of North America. So much water was locked in these glaciers that the oceans shrank, exposing land that is now long gone. What is today the continental shelf, the wide, shallow platform that rings the gulf, would have been dry land during that time. This had several dramatic effects. The Yucatan Peninsula and Florida were much closer together than they are today. The gulf was more like a vast bay, ringed with river valleys, marshes and coastal plains. Vast stretches of habitable land, rich in freshwater springs, forests and game, would have existed between the now distant coasts. Key underwater features like the Florida Platform and Campeche Bank were exposed, forming stepping stones between regions. For early humans, this meant opportunity. Groups living on what is now the Yucatan coast could have travelled overland, or via short canoe trips to the Florida region, or vice versa. These now submerged areas could have supported entire communities, migration corridors, and even trade routes. Some archaeologists now believe that the earliest inhabitants of Florida and Yucatan may have shared more in common than previously thought, not just genetically, but culturally too. The presence of similar tools, early artistic expression, and the close proximity of their now submerged coastlines suggest interaction, or even shared origins. And then came the flood. Starting around 12,000 years ago, the climate began to warm, the glaciers retreated, and sea levels began rising rapidly, in some cases by several feet per century. Within a few thousand years, the ancient coasts were drowned, entire landscapes vanished, rivers became bays, settlements were submerged. The once close peninsulas of Yucatan and Florida became separated by open water, isolating people, cultures and ecosystems that had once been connected. This drowning of the coast not only erased key parts of human history, it also created one of archaeology's greatest challenges. Where are the coastal settlements of the first Americans? Many are likely underwater now, buried beneath silt, sand and coral on the floor of the modern gulf. And yet the evidence we do have, like the skulls from Quintana Roo, the mastodon sites in Florida, and the carved bones from Vero Beach, suggests that people once thrived along these vanished coasts. They hunted, traveled, and perhaps even traded across a gulf that was not yet a gulf. It's a haunting reminder, the shape of the world can change, but the stories remain, waiting to be discovered. What secrets lie beneath the turquoise waters of the gulf? Could the story of the first Americans be more complex and more human than we ever imagined? Beneath the warm waves and limestone caves of Mexico and Florida, archaeologists have uncovered skulls, tools, and even the haunting remains of a young girl whose death and incredible preservation are shedding light on a forgotten world. From ancient skulls in the Yucatan to the mammoth hunters of Ice Age Florida, this is a tale of survival and exploration across 15,000 years of human history. It began with a tragic accident and ended in a revelation. In a deep underwater sinkhole or cenote in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, cave divers discovered the nearly complete skeleton of a teenage girl who died over 12,000 years ago. Dubbed Naya, her remains were found lying alone in a collapsed chamber more than 130 feet deep, surrounded by ancient animal bones and crystal clear water. Why was she there? Did she fall while searching for water? Was she fleeing danger or simply exploring? We may never know for sure, but what we do know is that her death has become one of the most important archaeological discoveries in the Americas. Naya's skeleton, one of the oldest and most complete ever found in the New World, offers a rare and intimate glimpse into life during the late Pleistocene, a time of saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, and massive ground sloths. Radiocarbon dating confirmed her age at around 12,000 to 13,000 years old, placing her squarely within the era when humans were just beginning to spread across the Americas. Even more astonishing, her facial structure and DNA, 
Unlike modern Native Americans whose faces tend to resemble those of East Asians, Naya had narrower features, including a more prominent forehead and smaller cheekbones. This fueled speculation that early Americans may have descended from multiple migrations. But Naya's mitochondrial DNA told a different story. She belonged to haplogroup D1, a genetic lineage found only in modern Native Americans. This discovery helped solve a mystery that had puzzled scientists for decades. Why do some of the oldest skulls in the Americas look so different from later populations? The answer may lie not in separate migrations, but in natural changes in appearance over time, caused by climate, diet, and isolation. And Naya isn't alone. Other skulls recovered from the underwater caves of Quintana Roo, dating from 8,500 to 13,500 years ago, reveal an astonishing diversity of facial shapes and sizes. Some resemble modern Arctic peoples, others show traits common in Europeans, Asians or South Americans. Beneath the jungles and luxury resorts of the Yucatan Peninsula lies a flooded underworld, a maze of underwater caves and senities that have preserved some of the oldest and most mysterious human remains in the Americas. Among these are four skulls recovered between 2008 and 2015 from the limestone sinkholes of Quintana Roo, just miles from the tourist town of Tulum. But these skulls are not just old, they are strange. Their features don't match the expected look of early Native American ancestors. In fact, they don't even match each other. This startling fact emerged from a detailed study using 3D geometric morphometric analysis, a cutting-edge technique that digitally compares bone shape using anatomical landmarks. The team examined the cranial shapes of the four individuals and compared them to skulls from across the globe, including ancient and modern populations in Asia, the Arctic, South America and Europe. What they found was astonishing. Each skull resembled a different population. One had features most similar to modern Arctic people, another had affinities with Europeans, a third had a mix of Asian and Native American traits, while the fourth bore resemblance to South American indigenous groups. This broad morphological diversity, within just four individuals, strongly challenges the long-held assumption that the first Americans came from a single founding population. Could it be that humans arrived in multiple waves from different regions of Eurasia? That's the conclusion the researchers are now considering. Rather than a linear migration from Siberia through Beringia into North America, the diversity seen in the Quintana Roo skulls may indicate parallel migrations, perhaps at different times using different routes, including along coastlines by boat. One thing is clear. The early populations of North America were far more diverse than previously believed. So who were the first Americans? A single group or many? The discovery of Naya, along with the analysis of other skulls from underwater caves, suggests a richer, more complex story. These were people who lived, traveled, hunted, and died in the vast wildernesses that once bordered the ancient gulf. And there's more. The researchers also noted that this diversity decreases as you move south, suggesting that as populations spread into South America, they became more genetically and morphologically homogenous. This bottleneck effect may have been due to smaller group sizes, isolation, or selective pressures in new environments. In contrast, the early populations in North America, especially near the Gulf, retained a rich diversity, a fingerprint of their varied origins. So what does this mean for our understanding of the first Americans? It suggests that the story is far from simple. The Quintana Roo skulls, combined with the discovery of Naya, the 12,000-year-old girl found in a nearby sinkhole, point toward a more complex and dynamic peopling of the Americas, one in which multiple ancestries, coastal migrations and regional adaptations all played a role. Before Europeans arrived, the Gulf's coastlines were home to countless indigenous civilizations, the Maya, the Olmec, the Aztec and numerous coastal tribes across what's now the southern United States. Their languages are largely lost to us, and with them, the names they once used for the Gulf. When Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean in 1492, he didn't see the Gulf, but his voyages sparked a flood of European expeditions. By the early 1500s, explorers like Juan Ponce de Leon and Alonso Álvarez de Pineda began charting the Gulf Coast. De Pineda's maps showed a continuous coastline, one that linked Florida, Mexico and the Caribbean in a grand maritime system. Initially names were vague, including El Mar del Sur, the Southern Sea, 
or simply El Golfo. It wasn't until 1519 when Hernán Cortés landed near Veracruz that the term Gulf of Mexico began to take shape. As Cortés overthrew the Aztec Empire and established New Spain, the Spanish began naming the body of water after the heart of their new empire, Mexico, a term derived from natives of the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. By the 1520s and 1530s, maps like Diego Ribeiro's 1529 world map began using the term Golfo de Mexico. Over time, this name became standard across European maps, replacing alternatives and cementing Spain's control over both land and the sea. Around 14,500 years ago, people living on the other side of the Gulf, near what is now Tallahassee, Florida, hunted mastodons, wielded stone tools, and may have even traveled with domesticated dogs. At a site called Page Ladson, deep beneath the Orsilla River, archaeologists found unmistakable evidence of pre-Clovis people, including butchered mastodon bones and the possible remains of Canis familiaris, a dog. This discovery upended decades of archaeological dogma. For years, the Clovis culture, known for its distinctive spear points, was thought to be the first population in the Americas, arriving around 13,000 years ago. But this site pushed that date back at least a thousand years, revealing an older, more widespread human presence. How did these people get there? One theory suggests they may have come by boat, traveling along the Pacific coast, cutting across Central America, and reaching Florida via the Gulf. Another proposes an inland route, down the Columbia and Mississippi rivers, across the southeast, and into Florida's lush river basins. Some may have followed the Atlantic coast from the Arctic, hugging shorelines all the way down to the subtropics. No matter the route, these people were resourceful, brave and adaptive, using sharpened stone tools to bring down animals ten times their size. In Vero Beach, Florida, a fossil hunter made an astonishing discovery, a carved bone fragment showing what appears to be a mammoth or mastodon. The creature's arched back, domed skull and curling trunk are unmistakable. Engraved by human hands, the bone may date to 13,000 years ago, making it the earliest known art of its kind in the Americas. Similar engravings have been found in Europe and Siberia, but never before in the Western Hemisphere. It suggests a shared impulse across continents to record, to remember, to leave something behind. Nearby, the site known as the Vero Man site yielded human skeletons lying beside extinct Ice Age animals. Dismissed for years as a mistake, new studies have confirmed that the bones are indeed from the Pleistocene and represent the largest collection of Ice Age human remains found in North America. As sea levels rose at the end of the Ice Age, many of these early sites, especially along the Gulf Coast, were submerged. Vast swaths of coastline are now underwater, hiding settlements, tools, bones, and maybe even carved stones beneath hundreds of feet of seawater. How many more stories lie beneath the waves of the Gulf? From the skull of a teenage girl in Yucatan to the carving of a mammoth in Florida, to the name stamped on a Spanish map, the Gulf has always been a place of movement, memory and mystery. And yet so much is still unknown. What other bones lie in the dark underwater chambers of the Yucatan? How many stories have yet to be uncovered, hidden behind the limestone curtains and crystal waters of these underwater caves? As the research continues, one thing is clear. The Gulf region, particularly Quintana Roo, may hold the key to understanding the true origins of the first Americans. The Gulf of Mexico, or Gulf of America as some now call it, is more than a geographic term. It's a symbol of imperial expansion, of erasure of indigenous tribes, and of the complex interweaving of cultures that has defined this region for over 15,000 years. From the underwater caves of Quintana Roo to the butchery sites of Florida's mastodon hunters, the Gulf has seen it all. It's a cradle of diversity, a corridor of migration, and a canvas for the earliest human art in the Americas. It has witnessed conquest and catastrophe, naming and forgetting. But above all, it has been a stage for the human drama. Young girls falling into caves, families chasing mammoths, artists scratching ivory with stone, and explorers renaming the world. So next time you gaze across the Gulf's sparkling waters, ask yourself, what lies beneath? What ancient footsteps are buried in the sand? What stories have we only just begun to hear? Thank you for watching and please leave a comment and subscribe to the channel.